Hey guys, what's up? It's Em. Welcome back or welcome to my channel. So I've actually recently gotten a lot of questions from people I know in real life about my study abroad experience. So I thought it'd be really interesting and potentially helpful to those of you who are considering going on study abroad. So I've been answering a lot of questions recently about the class application process, along with choosing dorms, places on campus to live. And so I'm just gonna do a full breakdown of what it was like to study abroad in Singapore, specifically at NUS, which is the National University of Singapore. And so this will also be from the lens of an industrial design student, cause that is what my major is and that's what I studied while abroad in Singapore. How the process worked for me was that I first applied through my home university and then I think people were chosen and from there your names were sent on to NUS and then they would send you your formal acceptance letter. And so that's how that worked for me. So after you formally accept your acceptance letter, then they will give you information on how to enter into the portal where you will sign up for classes. So this course sign up process might vary from school to school, not only home university, but also the university that you're applying for. But in the portal, you indicate the classes that you want based on rank. And then from there, the advisor will put you in the classes. For me, studio is mandatory since I have to take that every single year in order to graduate as an industrial design major. So for sure, that was number one on my list. And I also added an industrial design elective. It was digital sketching and painting. And together that was 14 credit hours. So from here on out, I might just accidentally use Singapore and NUS interchangeably. But if I'm talking about school and then I mentioned Singapore, I'm most likely just talking about NUS DID specifically because I can't really speak to the experiences at other universities. So just a heads up. So at NUS, studio counts for 10 credit hours, which is a lot, a lot, a lot. Make sure you understand your credit hour transfer equivalencies for your home university. So for us, because studio over there counts for so many credits, the extra credit hours transfer over as extraneous electives. So you can use those extra hours to bump up your elective hours. When I got my results back, the advisor or whoever was in charge of doing the classes, they put me in two classes out of the 10 that I ranked. So that was my top two, which were studio and the digital sketching and painting class. And together that was 14 credit hours. So I think there was a kind of phase two of registration where you could try to apply for more classes, but I didn't really wanna go through the hassle of doing that, number one. And number two, 14 credit hours is enough for me to be a full-time student and also I didn't want to bog myself down with taking a lot of classes since I really didn't know what the studio workload would be like. Studio at NUS is different from my studio in that it's two studios running at the same time. One studio where you do an individual project and one where you do a group project so I wasn't really sure how this juggling of two projects at once would work and I also wanted to ensure that I had enough time to explore and have fun so that's why I didn't really choose to take a lot of classes. However, I will say that that has set me back a little bit in terms of my classes because there are a lot of mandatory design courses that I needed to take my sophomore spring year that they only have in the spring. So now as a junior next semester, I do need to take those sophomore classes in order to make up for the classes that I missed while I was abroad. You kind of have to be very decisive with making these scheduling choices because these classes, they're not gonna take themselves. You're gonna have to take them at some point. So the next thing that I did was housing. And housing is one of the things that caused me the most pain and struggle, or one of the, yeah, one of the things that caused me the most pain and struggle in my study abroad experience. While I was trying to pay for my housing deposit, my credit card blocked the transaction from going through. I didn't realize, I guess I should have, but since it was a Singaporean website, it processed it as like international bank fraud. And so it blocked the transaction immediately. My first thoughts were that it wasn't that big of a deal. I'll just go through the portal again because the payment never went through. So I don't know why it would let me move forward. However, because the payment portal was a pop-up and it had already popped up once, it wasn't letting me re-enter the payment portal to try to pay again. So what I did was I emailed the housing office at NUS and I was like, hey, I'm an exchange student. They're not letting me pay. I'm 
I'm actively trying to give you my money so that I can have somewhere to live. Please help. I'm not sure why the portal is being really funky. A week, two weeks, some period of time goes by and I don't hear back. And then I get an email saying that because I hadn't paid in time, they were giving my housing spot to someone else. And this housing spot was originally in Prince George Park, which is one of the really big resident dorm halls that they have at NUS. And it's actually where a lot of exchange students do live. So then when I see this, it really sends me into a panic. And then I actually end up calling them. And I was like, hey, I emailed and I never heard back. And now they have given my spot to someone else. And they told me that the email that I emailed wasn't an email that they used. And I was like, why did I find this on your website then? It was a whole kerfuffle and I'm not gonna lie. I know no university has a great housing office, but when I called them, I was calling internationally, which meant that I had to really adjust to the time zones. Of course, the service was not always perfect. And so sometimes I would be still trying to ask questions and they would just straight up hang up on me. It was just immediately, the lady would hang up. Like this happened multiple times and I would really have to fight to keep the conversation going. Thankfully, what I ended up doing was I got our exchange program advisor and thankfully she was able to connect me with someone who was pretty high up at the housing department and they were thankfully able to offer me a new spot at CAPT. So CAPT is College of Alice and Peter Tan, which is a residence college. And that was actually on the other side of campus in U-Town. It actually kind of worked out perfectly because my boyfriend, he was placed in the dorm directly next to CAP. So we were able to be together on the same side of campus, which was really nice. Furthermore, I was placed in a suite, which meant that we had our own separate bathroom from the main big communal bathroom on our floor. And my suite mates were super lovely and sweet. And I also had another exchange student living in my same suite. Shout out to Rachel if you're watching this. And so that leads me to one of the questions that I got asked and that's where would I recommend living? So I think because I just totally lucked out and scored with where I was living, I really loved U-Town. And I might be biased because I was living in the U-Town area, but I feel like they just have so, it's just so nice over there. They have this big green lawn and at night people will sit in the grass and talk. And in that area, there's like a waffle place that does like soy ice cream and like waffles slathered in a sauce of your choice. Peanut butter waffles for the win, you guys. <laughs> but just the vibes were really nice and peaceful. There, you were just super close to food, places to chill. If you're gonna be going to Singapore, the bus that takes you into Clementi is super duper close. So that was really, really convenient. And I really like that. But I will say that the study spots, they don't open until very late. I feel like it's really common for American universities to have 24 hour study spots like the libraries and like all the other places are like 24 hours. I think they closed down the building at like around 10 or something. So like really, really early. But I also do know people who lived at PGP and they really loved it. So I think anywhere is like very solid. So moving on to more conversations about classes. So I would say that the course load that I had specifically, so my two classes with 14 credit hours was relatively manageable. So I feel like I had a pretty good balance between work and play with that kind of a schedule. I think that I could have added a third class and been okay, but I really just didn't want to risk it. The grading system though, was that you don't get kind of grades along the way on certain assignments. You just get one letter grade at the end. So you are kind of stuck in this state of oblivion. As an exchanger, I wasn't really in that kind of a hardworking, try hard mentality. So I just kind of was like, ignorance is bliss. I don't really need to know about my grades. And then I got smacked with some pretty mediocre grades. And the next topic I wanna to talk about is traveling outside of your study abroad country. My projects were due way before the final exam period, which was really nice because I got to take a few of the later weeks after my projects were done to just really tie up some loose ends on exploring Singapore. So I know a lot of people travel during the semester, but feasibly with all my projects going on, I really did not want to risk it. And some people were actually getting COVID while they were traveling. 
and ended up having to quarantine, which did cause some conflict within some of the group projects where there were exchangers who traveled within those groups. That being said, I think there was plenty to do in Singapore still. So that also kind of informed my decision to stay in Singapore instead of traveling during the semester. But once the semester ended, we first went to Bali. And then after Bali, we ended up taking a weekend trip to Malaysia. And then after Malaysia, we went to Sydney, Australia. So I would highly recommend traveling around the area that you're studying abroad in if you are financially and schedulely able to do so. I know that this might not be an option for some people and I would say it's not gonna make or break your experience, but in my opinion, it really is something that is valuable and worth considering if you are able to. So that was it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and this helped you with your study abroad questions. And I really hope that this helps anyone out there avoid the whole housing kerfuffle. Like that was honestly one of the most stressful times in my life because I genuinely thought I would be like living on the streets in Singapore on my study abroad. If you guys are in the process of applying for study abroad and you guys are really stressed, this is your sign that everything will be okay, it'll work out, and I'm manifesting good vibes for you and you are gonna have the best time of your life on your study abroad and then you're gonna become addicted and you're just gonna wanna study abroad for like forever in an endless loop and like never graduate and just travel and take classes. But with that, I'll see you in the next video. I love you guys very much and I'll see you soon, bye.